everyone for uh, for joining today's webinar to learn more about the uh, Feed the Future Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, my name is Robin Strest again, and I'm the Research and Capacity Building Manager for, for the lab. And, and we want to welcome you all on behalf of the lab. And uh, just a few housekeeping uh, reminders, uh, you know, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Please use the chat feature to engage in relevant uh, conversation with other attendees, as well as the panelists here, Dr. Wave and myself. If you have a question for us, please use the Q&A feature. <coughs> And uh, with that, what I will do now is introduce you all to the director of the, the Feed the Future Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab, Dr. Patrick Webb. Uh, Dr. Webb, uh, Professor Webb is the Alexander McFarlane Professor of Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. And with that, Dr. Webb, over to you. Thank you for being so brief. That's <laughs> what we deserve. So welcome everyone, welcome friends for, uh, for for joining us this evening. We decided, Robin and I, uh, we are actually in Dhaka right now on a very short trip. And we uh, decided that uh, it wouldn't be possible to come and meet everyone in person, although we will do that, uh, hopefully in the coming year. Um, but we would just introduce ourselves and our program to you in, in this format, uh, particularly in the evening. Hopefully it's not disturbing your, your uh, family time too much, but uh, allows you to, to engage. So we're introducing um, a new, it's a USAID funded Be the Future Innovation Lab. Some of you know us already. Uh, we've been around as an innovation lab since 2010, uh, but working explicit, specifically in Bangladesh since around 2014. Uh, and that lab was called the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Next, Robin. And through uh, a series of studies, uh, some research over the period from about 2014 um, onwards until now, uh, we were looking at uh, how to bring various combinations, bundling of uh, combinations of, one second, of um, activities at the farm level uh, to see if they, they, you know, for example, if a household uh, engages in agriculture, what, if, what happens if you add horticulture or vice versa? Uh, do you get more uh, bang for your buck when they are com combined at the farm level? Particularly because you're looking at nutrient dense foods, by which we mean obviously fish and fish uh, aquatic products, but also fruits and veg fatty legumes, chickens, egg, dairy, and so on, right? We're looking very much at nutrient-rich foods and how to get more of those into the diets of all people in Bangladesh. So we did a series of studies. We can share those. Anyone who's interested can contact us and we can share some of the, the papers that have been published. But we did find that diversification across multiple forms of agriculture led not only to more production, uh, it led to higher sales at higher prices of these nutrient-dense foods, but also that at the same time, those families consumed more of those nutrient-dense foods as well. They produced more, and some of that went to home consumption, the rest went for sale, increasing income, which allowed them also to purchase more and better food in the market. So there's a lot of background research there from Bangladesh and other countries that we did, looking at, um, <clears throat> well, identifying evidence that helps policymakers make decisions around, for example, diversification from aquaculture to other forms of nutrient-rich foods. And that's important. At the same time, though, there's a lot of food loss and waste. There's a lot of concerns about food safety and adulteration relating to nutrient-rich foods, which are typically perishable. Obviously, fish and milk jump out, but so do fruits and veg and other nutrient-rich foods. And there's a lot of, been a lot of focus on what are technology innovations that could post-harvest improve drying and storage of perishable foods. And we tested a, a range of those uh, that are known in Bangladesh, including chimney dryers and cool storage and so on. And we found, yes, they work, but they are not always adopted at, at a scale. Uh, and what's often lacking 
is a bundle of additional things that need to change to make adoption possible. That includes understanding the scale of demand, uh, the cost effectiveness of investment and, and likely profit, and then the affordability of those foods once they get into the marketplace. So there's a lot of things that are good that we found out over the, the previous uh, iteration. Uh, now we want to take things to a next step. Next, um, Robin. So we've been um, asked by USAID to uh, take on a new innovation lab, a new name. It still has nutrition in it, but it's Food Systems or Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, so this is one, still just one innovation lab among several dozen funded by USAID. And some of you know well the other labs like Post Harvest Losses, and the Food Safety Lab, and the Aquaculture Lab, for example. And we work closely. We will work closely with them. Um, a lot in all of their work and our work. Um, but while many of them, the other labs are focused essentially on the farm, pre-farm and on the farm up to harvest and say in the farm gate, our focus is really post farm gate. It's what else happens in the food system, not just the value chain, because value chains we typically think of as one commodity, one food. What happens in the system that allows a consumer to have a diverse, safe, nutrient-rich meal, right? Which includes many foods. So you see the kinds of foods that we're, we're talking about. So are there way, different ways of, of managing things post Farmgate uh, that could allow for reduced food loss and waste among these kinds of foods, uh, enhance the food safety of these kinds of foods, uh, at the same time promoting demand for and access to those foods? So if the affordability and the desirability of these foods has to be a pull factor, just as we are interested in the push factor from the production side. Next. One of the many things we've been doing uh, with our collaborators, so that here you have a lot of logos and names. Uh, this innovation lab, because it is about the food system as a whole, which includes lots of complex moving parts. Um, we've established a collaboration of 20 um, institutions to help us with this because you need complementary skill sets, resources, and, and networks uh, and contacts. So some of these are, are well known to you, and some of, the, some of them are global in their reach, like ICRASAT and IFPRI and HKI. Uh, many are specific to the US as academic institutions who have specific skills in a specific set, uh, domain um, within um, the, uh, the food system. Next, Robin. And with them, uh, in our first period of work, um, we're going to be explaining to you what we did in terms of a scoping of the landscape of innovation. So I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but let me just explain how we're going to be um, working. The first is generating evidence, research for development, let's call it that, applied research, on a range of questions around not just technologies, but necessary policies and best practices. Right? And we're going to be mainly doing that through funding a series, probably of annual calls for proposals, requests for applications, RFAs. And they're going to be of various size and various duration, one, two, maybe possibly three years of various scale. Um, and inevitably there will be some in Bangladesh. We're also working in other countries in the region, Nepal being the, the principal one. Um, and, but we're really trying to understand what are the innovations beyond technologies that can change the game along the, the, the value chain, the supply chain, the food system. And that requires us to work not only with researchers, but with the private sector, SMEs, civil society, NGOs that are implementing, sometimes piloting innovative programs, and of course, the, the public sector, the government, and the various responsible parties down to the districts and, and, and below. We will also be engaging in capacity development over these coming years, uh, various workshops, trainings, dissemination events, when we identify various uh, innovations, 
generate new evidence, we will of course share that on the ground here in Bangladesh, not just in Dhaka, but in Bangladesh. Uh, we also plan various technology prizes, innovation challenges, and so on, to try and draw out innovators uh, and innovations and build a network of partners who are willing to engage with this complex space and try and together co-create some uh, new ways of thinking and new ways of acting. And so that requires a lot of stakeholder engagement. That's part of what we're doing with you this evening is reach out and engage uh, not just with researchers, obviously we come from a university in the US, Tufts in Boston, but business players, government, uh, donors, and, uh, and beyond, right? So this is going to be something that takes, uh, hopefully takes, brings a lot of new ideas, interesting ideas uh, that can be fed into not just pilot, but even scalable programs um, in the country. Next, please. As I mentioned, there are a lot of issues uh, to, to, to consider. And so just three ones to plant seeds in your mind uh, as we go forward. Um, one of them is, you know, what are the evidence gaps? And, and this isn't about discovering new technologies, right? There are a lot of technologies. Many of them have been developed and tested in, in uh, Bangladesh and Nepal. But the question is, why have they not necessarily in all places been adopted at a scale and then sustained and uh, become profitable? So when I use evidence gaps, I don't mean just scientific ones. I do mean, where, where are the business models? Where's the evidence on cost effectiveness analysis? Where have people delved into uh, what it takes to overcome barriers uh, to adoption? That's number one. The second is how to support innovation. What is the research to scalable adoption uh, process in a country like Bangladesh, um, specifically with a focus on healthy diets, right? There's a huge and important and, and necessary focus in Bangladesh on agriculture uh, productivity and mechanization and raising yields and protecting against pests and diseases. All of that has to be supported and is important. But healthy diets don't just emerge from that. A lot has to go on in, in uh, the value chains and in raising awareness. It's a complex value chain. So clearly we can't change everything at once and no one pretends that we can, but we need to start somewhere. Uh, this, it's quite important. There are a lot of things wrong with people's diets and a lot of things wrong with the way uh, that climate change is going to impact food systems in Bangladesh. We have to be thinking now about 20 years from now, uh, but where do we start? Right? So these are important fundamental issues that we have to uh, think about as we go forward. Next, Robin. So our first step was to actually look at policies and uh, statutes and acts and institutions across Bangladesh, as well as programs and pilots that are going on. I just uh, focusing on this one, which is a uh, text drawn from Bangladesh's own national commitments for food systems transformation. And that's national pathways that the government and other stakeholders have pulled together. And I just wanted to, I just pulled this out because this wording is clearly reflective of a, an acknowledged need in Bangladesh. And it allies closely to the kind of things that I've been talking about, right? The need for private investment and work with the private sector, work from not from the farm all the way through processing, storage, packaging, all the way to the consumer, reducing food loss and waste of all kinds, um, uh, and, and trying to find ways to improve processing and storage and distribution and refrigeration and all of this requires public private sector. It could be called collaboration, but interaction, engagement. And that's, so it's clearly stated here in the government's own commitments. And therefore we need to step up and try and find ways to help this, make this happen. Next. I mentioned that we are interested in the whole food value chain. The food system goes from pre-producer 
to post-consumer. And a lot of emphasis has been placed in those three blue boxes um, to the left, uh, which are really about the farm, agriculture, it's the production, uh, how to enhance seed quality and input supplies, mechanization and so on. As I said, that's all important. But healthy diets don't rely just on that. They rely on everything else that comes to the right of those three boxes. Um, and there are many, many different stakeholders, many different investment patterns, many different interests, both from the government side and the private sector side, um, to be considered uh, along this chain. Next, Robin. Uh, and there's not, it's, which means that there's not one entry point, right? We need to figure out multiple entry points in those chains and figure out how to make innovations work. So I mentioned that a first step in what we did, and I'm just gonna give a brief introduction and hand over to Robin to go into more detail, was a scoping exercise. We, we used USAID's existing agriculture scalability tool, which is a tool for assessing the importance of an innovation, its credibility, uh, what are the requirements for adoption and the benefits and risks for adopters, and then potential, what is the enabling environment that impedes or will facilitate commercialization, the upscaling of adoption, right? So that tool was created to look at ag innovations. We adapted it somewhat to be able to incorporate innovations, again, not just technologies, but innovative practices, innovative policies, innovative investment approaches and so on, um, along the value chain. Next, Robin. And this was a global assessment, it wasn't just focused on Bangladesh, although a lot of the innovations um, were ones that we have seen uh, in Bangladesh. And you'll, you'll certainly be familiar with some of these. This is just pick, picks out three technology innovations. Hermetic storage bags, PIX bags, some Grain Pro bags, they all have different names. Uh, chimney dryers, which are essentially using uh, hot air drawn through a chimney to, to go through a uh, various trays which can dry fruit and veg or fish or other things, and then drying beads to re reduce the moisture or content of various uh, commodities before they go uh, into storage or processing. So the reason we're highlighting these is that various innovations can score higher or lower depending on those credence attributes, if you like, the various criteria by which raters uh, had a look at these. Now, this wasn't done just by us. This was done by uh, at least, well, it was led by five different uh, consortium members and each consor each of those groups had 10 members. So we're, we're talking about 50 at least raters uh, of these various um, activities. Robin, next. And what jumps out when you look at this is that at the, the high at the upstream level for storage bags and drying beads, you see quite high. The higher the number, zero to five, the high, the closer to five you get, the higher the score. And that's upstream in, term, in terms of it's important, it, it potentially addresses a problem and it is credible, it's likely to work. Next, Robin. However, when you go further downstream in the attributes, what is there an environment in which the adoption and the commercialization of that technology could happen, you see much lower scores, for example, right, for those two innovations. Next, Robin. Um, and there are, of course, other innovations where, in fact, the, the scores through all the way through are actually lower than others. Right? And this is through uh, multi multiple raters, right, over time, who are all experts in various domains. Uh, coming up with average scores. This doesn't, this isn't the end of the story. This is the beginning. It, it gives an indication of where we prioritize, what to prioritize. But it points out that just because an idea may be a good idea and that maybe it works at a pilot level, it's not always clear that it's going to be adoptable at large scale. Next, Robert. So I think I will hand over to, to Robin to, to, to walk you through, unfortunately very briefly, but to walk you through 
Um, what we found from these innovations, which as I said, were global, but many of them had resonance for Bangladesh. So let me hand it to you, Robin, and uh, take it over for now. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, so as Patrick mentioned, uh, the scales, the scoping exercise had two parts to it. What uh, Patrick just presented was uh, a prioritization exercise using the, the agriculture scalability tool that was adapted to fit into our uh, need for the prioritization. And before that, what the consortium also did was to create a census of innovations globally as to you know how many innovations are out there that are focused in each domain from agriculture production, post farm gate processing, storage and packaging, to markets, to food environment, retail and consumer behavior. So what you see here is a compiled list of innovations by geography, by at, at the regional level, as you can see a total of 276 innovations focused on the three priority area uh, that is nutrient dense foods, uh, food loss and waste and food safety were identified that had some level of evidence of implementation. And as you can see for South Asia and Southeast Asia, there were about 163 innovations that were identified. And I also like to highlight that USAID has a global innovation exchange where there are about uh, 7,000 innovations that are co been compiled by different projects and, and programs supported by USAID. And out of that, uh, out of the 276, 76 innovations that were compiled are from the global innovation exchange database as well. On your right side, uh, the figure so just the distribution of uh, innovations by uh, value chain domain. Like you know, uh, for example, for South Asia, uh, in the in the three value chain agriculture production, uh, processing, storage, and packaging, food environment, retail, and consumer behavior, we see a, a similar number of innovations uh, that uh, spread out across across uh, these these value chain domains. And, and as Patrick had mentioned before, you know, these innovations, the census of innovation were done by uh, our, our five uh, working groups uh, that had at least 10, 10 uh, working group members for each uh, working group. Just to note, Robin, that your camera's off, if that's unintentional. No, 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 sorry about that, okay. And so then we looked at, okay, uh, you know, how do we define innovation? So, uh, you know, for us, innovation does not limit to product or technologies. We also look at processes, services, uh, institutions, policies, uh, practices, and so on. So when we talk about innovation by types, uh, we are not only talking about products and technologies. And so what we did was like, the, the second uh, thing at the global level, we said, okay, you know, the 276 innovations, if we uh, disaggregate them by or categorize them by types, you know, what do we see? And, and this is uh, a picture of what we are seeing. Again, a lot of these innovations are products or technologies and, and uh, some are practices, metrics or processes. And so for Bangladesh in particular, we see that you know it's again uh, 63 innovations that are either products or technologies, 20 processes, policies, 19 practices, and then very few, three or four on, on the metrics and tools. And also out of the 276 innovations, Bangladesh, we found about 105 innovations that had some evidence of implementation in. So this is just a, a, a quick snapshot of the examples of the products and processes and practices that we are seeing in Bangladesh. Uh, so when you talk about processes, it's the market process, support for development and policy standards. For on the products, you know, some of the innovations that we have highlighted here are dryers, cold rooms, solar pumps, climatic storage, grids, and 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 um, antimicrobial paper liners for processing and packaging and fresh food vending machines. Uh, some of the innovations on the processes are dry chain concept, uh, post-harvest toolkit, uh, nutrition leveling, innovation food delivery systems and food traceability platforms, front of packaging, uh, package labeling and taxes on unhealthy foods. 
And on the practices and some of the innovations that you know we we, we just want to highlight is uh, warehouse storage practices for food grains, uh, hub and spoke innovation system, trade source. And so this is just an example of what kind of innovations were put together, compiled uh, through the working group and, and through our, our sense of, uh, scoping exercise. And so uh, what we did after the global census was to then you know, focus on individual focus countries. Uh, for, for the lab, uh, the first four countries that we are focused in is our Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Malawi, and Mozambique. So uh, this uh, slide has scoping findings that are more relevant to Bangladesh, and we see that you know, uh, focusing on those three priority areas, nutrient dense foods, food safety and food loss and waste, about, about 85 innovations kind of uh, address the food loss and waste, 73 on the nutri nutrient dense food, and about 35 on food safety. And when you look at it from the, the product processes and practices, you see that those innovations that are available and have some level of uh, implementation are mostly products, followed by processes and practices. So after that, uh, what we did was the second phase was uh, to, you know, given the, the suite of innovations that we have, uh, we said, okay, you know, why don't we do a thought experiment? Uh, and, and the obvious logic is when you have a, a, a suite of innovations identified through this exercise, we, that, that needs to be packaged together so that there's a potential synergy to scale for adopt, like Patrick suggested, or adapt. And so uh, these solutions, needs to come as packages. And so for example, scaling of new technology may require policy and legal frameworks, appropriate financing, uh, closing the digital divide, there needs to be a social acceptance and sound governance and institutions. So taking this, uh, we did a thought experiment in uh, you know, creating a bundle uh, or, a, or a bundling of innovations to see, yes, to address an outcome or a goal, you know, if you were to put together this suite of innovations, how would it look like? You know, what does a bundling of innovation look like so that it cut across the, the various domains of value chain, uh, food systems value chain. And so the next, uh, this slide is, is just a thought experiment. Uh, and we, we uh, did this thought experiment on improving access to fruits and vegetables in Bangladesh. So if we were to improve uh, uh, fruits and vegetables in Bangladesh, what kind of innovations are out there that can be put together as bundles? So we came and can be used for seeds as well as, as post-harvest. We came with video animations for extension dissemination to provide uh, awareness and, and, and information to the farmers and post farm get cold chain storage for storing of these fruits and vegetables before they go to the market. And then, you know, before they reach the market, buy active packaging, business to business uh, and, and business to consumer platform models. And then dynamic retail pricing labels as well as innovative multimedia campaigns uh, to, to improve its consumption. Uh, and so this, this, this innovation kind of focus on, on the consumer and the demand in. So this is an example of a bundling uh, uh, to, to, uh, with the goal of improving access to fruits and vegetables. What it does not have and what we would like to call it as a, as a black box is the uh, policy conducive environment that Pat Patrick highlighted in his slide as well, like, you know, enabling policy environment, monitoring standards, capacity at both at the farm and but at the, at the, at the consumer level uh, for increased awareness, access to finance, infrastructure, and so on. And with this thought experiment, uh, the key takeaways for us was that in this new agri food system literature, bundling of technologies, practices, and policies. They seem to have a greater potential for adoption, scalability, and profitability. And our bundling exercise also showed that you know most likely that multiple innovations are required in more than one part of value chain. It's there's no there's no magic bullet, so it has to come as as bundling, uh, and it has to be packaged in such a way that you know it comes more in in one or more parts of the value chain. 
And again, enabling policy environment standards, infrastructure, access to finance, you know, they need to be carefully considered when we are thinking about bundling, when we're thinking about scaling and profitability. And one thing I do want to highlight that, you know, a lot of these innovations are at different stages of development from, from um, proof of concept R&D to the scaling phase. So not all innovations that were compiled are at the same stage of development. So we need to be careful and there needs to be a careful assessment when, when we are talking about bundles, about where these innovations are at what stage and so to have a very synergistic cost effective effects. And so this is this is the, the website to our lab. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude my part and again, invite Patrick to kind of conclude the, the presentation. No, thank you, Robin. So just a, a last few, a few words, that was a very quick <laughs> synopsis of, of our thinking and where our initial um, attempt at, at scoping what is out there. That's what, what is taken. That, that's where it's taken us. This is our, our new website. Though the first four reports that summarizes what we found from that scoping exercise by segment of, of the value chain are available to you on this website. And a fifth one on metrics and tools will be up there um, shortly as well. This is also where we will be posting our requests for applications, the, the calls for proposals. Um, as, as we move forward. Um, let me, the final thing I would just highlight is that that thought experiment was just that. Of the innovations we found, various different configurations could make up a bundle. And what is often lacking are two key things. One is a business model for each component of such a package, such a bundle. And then some assessment of the value added, the actual value addition, the economic uh, impact of bringing these elements together and what is the additionality, the extra impact that you could get in terms of profit or other metrics of healthy diet or even nutrition outcomes, right? A lot more needs to be done uh, to generate evidence of what, the, what could different packages look like for different commodity sets in different parts of the country of Bangladesh? Uh, what is the business model for those components? And then how cost effective would it be for the government or private and or private sector to invest in making that happen? So these are key questions that uh, we need to broach in the coming years. And hopefully um, with your uh, collaboration and insights, um, as we go forward. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, see if, if you have any questions that require clarification or initial thoughts that you'd like to share in the, uh, in the, the chat box and we can certainly respond um, to those as necessary. But I do promise to finish on the hour. Um, we're not gonna take any more of your time than that. Uh, but if you have thoughts or questions, please feel free. not seeing many hands or comments, which I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative of assuming that means you understood everything and agree with everything you just said. On the other hand, if you have a comment to make, <laughs> so that if, if you can just hit that raise hand icon and I, you know, we can allow you to talk. There is a raised hand down there. Yeah. While you're thinking about that, let me find, just also add that we will be, we are a team, not just the two of us, we are a team plus our collaborators in the consortium. Uh, many of us will be visiting Bangladesh uh, many times over the coming years. We won't have our own fixed office here. Um, we, we have a uh, point of contact within the USAID mission, Fahad. Fahad. And um, yes, I see two, two things have just popped up. Safe foods production are often challenging by lack of incentives in the value chain. Yes, absolutely. 
and so one of the one of the absolutely one of the key key um, issues is about a better understanding the incentives and disincentives for the producer at one end, the consumer at, one, at the other end, and the private sector and all the other stakeholders in the middle. Right. So you're you're, you're spot on uh, figuring and. So one of the things we would like to do through this is to better understand, like I said, the cost and effectiveness, the cost and benefit of different approaches um, with a view to identi identifying how incentives can be improved. And some of that could be um, in the form of removing import tariffs on certain technology elements or government subsidies on the price of certain products or legislative changes in food safety standards that make that level the playing field and make it cheap cost cheaper and cost effective for everyone uh, to compete right so it's a it's a range of possible things that, that need to be done to improve those incentives so absolutely we totally agree with that and uh, thanks uh, Mohammed for, uh, for your kind words we will as I said we will be coming uh, frequently. We will keep you in an email list, let you know. We would love to be able to meet personally with each of you. And we're hoping to have a series of meetings where, of course, each of you would be uh, invited, both for thinking through the challenges, but also for disseminating um, findings as they, as they come along early on. So we see uh, the technically good, but not produced in Bangladesh, prices high, exactly. So, in other, the, we just Robin and I were just uh, at a consultation in in Nepal. That those same quest, same issues came up. Uh, not made in country. Uh, Nepal has an import tariff on plastic, uh, and so the price is much higher than it should it should be. Um, and the the adoption rate is extremely low, even for farmers who understand their value. Um, and so we have to change that. We have to figure out how to either in, generate local production or remove the, the cost increments uh, that make these uh, products unaffordable. Unaffordable, of course, means under current prices for the products that are stored, right? Those hermetic bags are, and, and the seeds in many cases are used for seed. Uh, for the next harvest, which is important, but sometimes they're used for produce that is stored and then sold later. So are there ways to store and sell at different times to have different price points? Um, so we understand absolutely that those, those bags are technologically sound, um, but scalable, not necessarily. And so that is, that is exactly the kind of question um, that we're um, talking about. Um, so, yes, Mohammed Harun, uh, the, the point about the um, grant application, so our first round has already, is already underway, it is closed, and there were four or five applications from Bangladesh. We, we don't know how many grants or which, which countries those grants will go to. Um, hopefully at least one will, will come to Bangladesh. That would be awarded probably in April. Um, but we're hoping that this will be a rolling round so that each of the coming years, we will have subsequent uh, calls for proposals. And we, we will let you know, we, our mailing list will grow. And as soon as we have um, something to share, we will share that with you uh, so that people understand this ahead of time. I would, the, just one caveat to that is that USAID has asked that it be a partnership the application be partners. So there be a US academic institution. It doesn't have to be one of our consortium members. It can be any academic institution in the US partnering with one or more in-country collaborators um, like yourselves. It could be private sector SMEs. It could be researchers at BAU, just to, uh, off the top of my head. Um, it could be a government institution or a, a civil society entity, right? So. Uh, an, an academic lead in the US and then partners uh, on the ground. The actual um, topics will likely vary, right? So as we learn more, 
from you as we learn more through this work over the time then the calls will be different we will tailor them to okay so what else do we need to know or what else can possibly be tested um, in in a, an appropriate context um, we often prosecute without having options for producers and yes well exactly a portfolio choice you know we, we we want more choice right we're not we're not in the business of picking one innovation and running with it and saying this is it this is the solution to everything that's not realistic it's not uh, the way to, to go about things. So there have to be options. And that's why we said the configuration of bundles of, of innovations is going to differ in different locations, different contexts. Um, but there does need to be competition. That is one of the key elements of, uh, of pricing, and price points, and profitability. Um, and so, yes, producers need choice. Um, so do consumers need the right choice. Um, and we want to find ways to uh, facilitate that both through awareness building and, and real um, innovations. Um, so crop development value chains, yeah, okay, thank you very much for pointing that out, uh, Mito. Um, as I said, you know, we are looking for collaborators and partners and people who will want to engage with us um, in this journey. And uh, that's really good, that's valuable to know. Uh, thank you for joining and thank you for sharing that. Any other comments? There's one question from Ferdos uh, that, you know, the purchasing, oh, packaging. packaging. Yes, now I don't, personally, I don't think enough attention has been paid to packaging. Uh, there's, the, you know, there's a lot on, on drying and cool, cold chain. Um, packaging to protect perishable foods, let's just call it that, um, and packaging doesn't have to be metallic or paper, right? It can be metal, it can be many, many things. It can be innovative packaging that protects individual fruits and veg to get them to the market without bruising. Uh, or it can be a packaging that um, hermetically seals, not through bags, but seals individual fruits and veg to reduce uh, maturation uh, You'll reduce the, the rotting, essentially the maturation, um, by keeping in nutrients. So protecting the shelf life, protecting the nutrients that are in foods. And that doesn't just mean fresh produce. It could also be processed foods that have not been, you know, there's no addition of sugar and salt and fat necessarily, but there could be processed foods, processed mangoes, for example, that have been dried um, that with a special appropriate packaging that is affordable could then survive complex value chain transportation to get to consumers um, and, and still be desired by those consumers. So I, I agree, uh, packaging is, is, a, is a big question and there, there is scope for innovation. Uh, we're looking absolutely for scope uh, for innovation in those places. And it's not just the farmers who need to purchase packaging. Um, but all, even the SMEs who are in that supply chain are also looking for packaging innovations to protect what they've purchased wholesale and are going to get to the to the retail um, outlets or to the marketplaces. Uh, before you go to the other question, Nazimuddin has his hand raised, so maybe I'll just have him share his comment, Patrick. Sure. Yes, please. Please, Nazim. Yeah, please go ahead, Nazim. Uh, uh, unmute uh, yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Robin and uh, my friend Petri. Huh? This is Nazim. I work for vegetables and fruits as well as, and mostly safe production. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm very much delighted uh, for inv getting invitation from this group. And uh, of course, uh, I, I did yes. And uh, you know, you already know I work for Bari, and many of mm -hmm. our colleagues also attend with this. So my uh, uh, little bit query or intention is like that we uh, focus mostly on uh, good agriculture practices or safe. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. in Bangladesh, there are many confusion uh, related to safe food uh, in terms of production. So yeah. 
uh, and and then the safe food and convert it. It is up to the nutritious food. It is it is nutrition nutrition lab. So uh, I think uh, it would be better uh, or design this food. Say which which is, which, which indicators related mm. to uh, safe food and uh, especially the uh, say vegetables or fresh products and nutrition. Mm. So uh, uh, during uh, even our next next process. I think I think we we everyone should consider that those two things. So it would be uh, it would be great uh, for this project, upcoming project, for proposing. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Absolutely, Nazim. Thank you for that. Um, really important. Yes. How do you measure um, empirically whether food is safe? But also then, how do you encourage a consumer to trust that it yeah. is safe those both sides are really important uh, and i think we do need to work on in both of those spaces dr saiful who's also here is um, working on a, a piece of research um with us and we hope we can share it with all of you soon which looks at cons consumer concerns and perceptions about food safety, particularly for this range of, of nutrient-rich foods. Uh, and it's very interesting, what, what are the drivers of those perceptions? Uh, you know, it's not just knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of other drivers and how people then deal with that perception varies across consumers. So we need to, we need to build trust uh, in all ways, right? So trust that it is safe empirically, but trust Help build awareness that if it's if some things are produced in a certain way, um, handled in a certain way, washed in a certain way, uh, that they are more likely to be safe and, and therefore fine for the family. So thank you. Yeah, very important point. Thank you. Thank you. Any other nice comments like that? There uh, is a question from Hafizul Hakan about how can small scale processor minimize competition between large and small scale processors? Any thoughts? Uh, I think, oh, well, that's, yeah, that's a market economics type of question. But in fact, small processors you usually succeed if they find a niche, they find a particular set of products that they can be more cost effective in working with and potentially a niche group of, of consumers targeting a certain certain groups of, of purchasers but i don't know it could be adolescent girls it could be it could be pregnant women it could be men you know who don't eat at home but want to eat, eat on the street right so it usually comes from product differentiation and market differentiation to allow for competition between the large and small but there is also then the potential that many of the large corporations are in some cases more focused on the production end, you know, the, the uh, input supply and purchase of, of, of raw materials in a sense. And there's a lot of scope and windows of opportunity for smaller enterprises in the value chain um, to, to, to get in there with a different kind of packaging or certain types of cold storage or improved transportation mechanisms that don't bruise fruits and veggies, right? So you get my point, right? The, it's about figuring out where is, where is it, where can I distinguish myself from the large companies and then building a brand in that niche. Not easy, but um, let's, let's think through that. And then we right. see yeah, food, lots of small scale food processors and local produce. Yes, uh, agreed, agreed. So some of the, we don't just want to know how to ensure that smallholders have access to technology that allows for effective drying and, and storage and processing. There needs to be good understanding of best practice, right? So 
best practice on the farm was talked about. That's very important from Barry's perspective. Um, but best practice all the way down the value chain post harvest. And so training, uh, training workshops, individual trainings, trying to find ways to communicate digitally potentially uh, could also be uh, explored. We are, you know, we don't exclude looking at um, digital platforms and trying to find ways to inform not just farmers about seed and prices, uh, but about best practices uh, so that they understand that if you do something in a certain way, their, their product will have greater value, not just nutrient value, but greater demand because it has been uh, prepared in a, in a certain kind of way. Need to figure out more about that. Exporting, yes, to other countries, it could be, uh, but it's easier in some cases to do just that. Um, we were, yeah, we were in discussion today with some uh, colleague who were talking about um, grain and the fact that millers and you know many parts of every many parts of the country have have millers who purchase grain obviously uh, locally, uh, but it's in their interest, the millers' interest, to ensure that that grain is of high quality and low moisture content. Right. And so there's a, there's a demand from the miller uh, to have a quality product come to them so that they can prepare a quality flour that they can then sell off. That kind of function, the miller function, doesn't exist for many of the fruits and veg, and legume and, and fish and so on, right? um, except where there's an export market, where the exporter set standards and criteria and grading, maybe do training uh, and so on. Um, so it's the exporting company that becomes the equivalent of Miller. But we have to find, are there potential ways to, to recreate that, that function within Bangladesh or Bangladesh um, in ways that makes it easier and safer to deliver healthy food to consumers locally? Uh, right now, we don't have that to figure out are there mechanisms where we could generate that kind of, uh, of demand for quality. Sorry, I think oh. I think for those these hands are I so so I'm just going to unmute for those and I then I think we need just one more I think because I did promise to finish it in okay. two minutes. Go ahead for those. Curtis, yes. Keep it, keep it, keep it short, please. Okay. Hello. Yeah, we hear you. Uh, good morning. <laughs> and also here, good evening. Uh, thanks uh, for the nice presentation uh, regarding horticulture uh, nutrition innovation lab. And that I think uh, it will be started soon in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And my, I have uh, some comments or some or also, uh, questions. You know, in our country, temperature and humidity is very high. This is very challenging yeah. for our agricultural yeah. producers as well as uh, for our uh, farmers and traders uh, to commercialize the product from field to market. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, is it possible to uh, develop some value-added products uh, like fresh cut? fresh fruits and vegetables, and some processed product. Uh, mm -hmm. can, we, uh, uh, can we assist uh, from this nutrition innovation lab for our trade farmers and traders as well as the stakeholders? And another, I have questions uh, for storage system, uh, especially for fresh producers. Uh, for, we, we don't have uh, good uh, packages for retail mm -hmm. consumers uh, mm -hmm. because our, most of the farmers are very small. Uh, yeah. we, we just uh, we are uh, uh, we are developing some uh, commercial farm in Bangladesh mm -hmm. recently. Uh, so in this case, we need some retail packages also for to mm -hmm. uh, use uh, our commodities from field to market. Uh, so in the, in these cases, do we have any opportunity to uh, get uh, the assistance from this project 
uh, another last questions for technology commercialization. So you know, uh, uh, in our country, uh, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, so especially for agricultural producers, we don't have post harvest kits, like post harvest treatments, like waxing materials, some fungicide. Mm -hmm. So can we get support from this project or uh, to develop any uh, project uh, uh, by this nutrition innovation lab? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Ferris. So very quickly, so we can finish. Um, waxing, protecting, packaging, innovations in cold storage, all of those are things that we're going to be looking at. It's not that our innovation lab will provide those, but what we will provide is evidence of what can work and what makes sense in different contexts. But the kinds of things, the kind of questions you've just asked could be part of a, a proposal that comes uh, in, re in response to our call, calls for proposals. If, it, if, if it's something not just a new innovation, but something that does potentially exist, maybe not yet in Bangladesh, but somewhere else, but testing and costing and validating uh, innovations of various kinds is absolutely what we're going to be doing. So we, we hope to continue this engagement with all of you. And um, thank you for taking an hour uh, on your Sunday evening to, to spend with us. We're very grateful and honored to, to, to have your presence here. And we will look out for us. We will be uh, sharing emails and contact you, contacting you over the coming months and into the coming years. So I wish you a very good evening, all of you. Safe evening. Um, and um, we'll see you and be in touch with you again soon. Thank you for joining. Thank you.